Hi, I'm Heidi with Capital Books, and we're very happy to be celebrating Bookstore Romance Day today with um, Terry Brisbane, C. Spencer, Lady Lainey Weber, Deanna Renee Hebner, and Helen Barclay. So welcome to our Crowdcast uh, virtual event. We've, uh, we're a relatively new store. We've only been open for a little over a year. So this is our first um, bookstore romance day. Uh, we do have a relatively large section of romance books in our store and they do sell fairly well. So uh, Sacramento is a good uh, reader community for you all. So that um, it was nice to be able to participate in this and, and we have quite a number of um, viewers for this session. So um, I'm going to ask um, if any of the viewers would like to pose a question to any of these authors, um, type it into the chat and then we'll reserve the last 10 minutes or so of the hour to answer questions. If anybody is interested in purchasing books from these authors, um, there's a, a button at the bottom of your screen which should take you to a listing of all of their books um, uh, carried by Capital Books and you can purchase. Um, one little weird thing I need to mention that we've learned with Crowdcast in session one is that Crowdcast only allows four videos going at a time. And Ross and I being the uh, uh, interviewee and the moderator, that takes up one screen. So we're because we have uh, five authors in this session, we're going to be rotating everybody out so that every all of you have a chance to answer the questions and to talk about your books and, and everything. So um, we're going to start off with C. Spencer, Terry, and Lainey, and then we will uh, loop in the others throughout the session. We kind of got the hang of it with session one, so we're almost professionals now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to introduce my husband and co-owner of the bookstore, Rock Rojek. He's going to mostly be your interviewer. And I will be the Wizard of Oz behind the, the curtain running the show here. The curtain's right there. The right here, yes. <laughs> I don't have any ruby slippers, but we'll, we'll get it going. The Wizard of Oz didn't wear ruby slippers. Well, Dorothy did. Character. Dorothy did, yeah. All right. Um, I, 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 some of this will be, if, if anybody is watching this the second time, they're watching the first session or the second session, some of this will be... Parts of my part will be repetitive because it's intro stuff, um, but all of you guys should have to answer, so that will make it uh, more interesting. But one of the things I, I brought up is the fact that romance is one of those sections that is um, difficult. It has such a broad amount of subgenres that it's hard to track. Um, in some cases, it's hard to sell. Um, I'd originally said that it's much like the science fiction fantasy series uh, in that you either carry the bestsellers and new releases or you go deep and you have lots of everything. And we're still kind of in the bits of everything stage. Um, and I, actually, I think it is potentially more like comic books than, uh, than books in, in, in two ways. One is that there are a whole lot of genres, and in bookstores, you don't rack things alphabetically. You rack them by the types of books there. You put the DC comics next to each other because Superman and Batman have something to do together, other than being alphabetical. The Marvel books are together and the like. So I think in some ways, racking romance books by historical versus contemporary versus paranormal is kind of a, a way to go. Um, the other part to it is, is that, um, and, and the reason why things like you know, Romance Bookstore Day happened is because it's still in some ways ghettoized. Um, some books mm -hmm. don't carry romance, some don't. Um, I spent years in comic book stores trying to get normal people to come in to buy what I felt were good graphic novels that, you know, you could read like a novel. And it's hard. Um, and I think in some ways romance is the same way. Uh, my latest attempt has been putting what could be general fiction books that are popular, um, Crazy Rich Asians, things like that, um, which could go either into general fiction, which is where they normally are, or into romance. If you stick them in romance and people look for them, then they have to look at everything else around them. So that's kind of been my latest experiment in seeing how to do 
things. So I think what we'll start first is um, let each of you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your book and books, and then also um, start with something short about what got you into writing or writing romance or what else you do if you're doing things besides romance books, and then we'll kind of go from there. So why don't you... Um, See, so you want to start things off? Sure. Um, my name is C. Spencer. I write lesbian romance from the alternating point of view of each protagonist. Um, my latest one is On Second Thought. It's backwards on the screen. And the first one is Truth or Fair. Um, what got me into writing? I guess it's... I, I read romance novels in high school and I enjoyed it because I love the happily ever after. And it just helps you escape from a bad day and it's a, it's a pick me up. Um, but there are there are a lot more lesbian romances um, now than there were not when I was in high school. And I just kind of wanted to put a spin on that and, and give our sort of story into the whole narrative of romance. Okay. Yeah. Lainey? Hi. Um, I'm Lainey Wedber. I'm from, I've got an awful echo, um, but I'm from Vermont. And my two books are behind me, A Chapter on Love and The Real Thing. My first book was published just in 2019. So some folks would think I'm a little late coming to the game of being an author. Um, but a it was a 94-year-old woman who got me to sit down and write my first book. I was helping her write her memoir. And um, she finished that and said to me, I wish I had done this earlier because now I have other stories to tell and I don't have enough time. And she said, don't you let that happened to you. <laughs> so I did. And I made a um, very purposeful choice to write lesbian contemporary romance. Um, I'm also a librarian, and I understand that the ghettoized feature of romance that you were talking about, because there are many libraries that won't carry romance books or think they're. They're, they should be in a little rack in the corner or something. Um, and then I think every reader deserves their space in the library and in the bookstore. And I think that lesbians and women who love women um, want to see their stories, their love stories, their happily ever afters, and their lady pirates, and <laughs> their lady baronesses as well. So, Terry? Hi, I'm Terry Brisbane. I write, this is my, oh, you can't see it, sorry. No. My most, most recent book, um, my 48th historical romance. Um, I've written um, for publishers, Harlequin, Berkeley, NAL, St. Martin's, Kensington, and I've also done some indie publishing as well. Uh, I'm kind of known for my Scottish Highlanders, my medievals. Um, I write very sexy, very emotional stories um, set in a time of men with big swords and hilts. Um, what got me into writing? I've always been a writer. I've always written something um, from grade school into high school and it was short stories and and it wasn't until um, I had my third child, I was almost 40, and I realized I had these ideas, and my husband encouraged me, and he said, write them down. And I said, but I'm not a writer, I'm a dental hygienist. He <laughs> said, well, you won't know until you write them. So I wrote them. And so my first book was published in 1998, and as I've said, this Outlaw's Honor um, is my 48th book. And about, about um, romance, um, you know, it's entertainment fiction, and it is looked down on by many, many in the literary community. And it's sad because it's there, you know, written um, to uh, entertain and to help us escape. And so that's how I promote it. Yeah. All right. I'm going to... Um 
swap out uh, C and Laney and then um, bring on uh, Leanna and Celeste. That's last. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's the last. <laughs> put somebody random on the screen. Somebody you know. random. <laughs> that could be bad. Could be very bad. Waiting for technology to catch up here. I found I clicked too fast and missed the prompts and oh. didn't let them okay. work. It says that they are accepting. There's Leanna. Hi, Leanna. Hi, friends. So did you hear the I did hear the question about what got us into writing. Are you able to hear me? Yep, you sound great. Great. So um, I write gothic gas lamp fantasy with romantic elements. So my, my latest series with Kensington is, uh, it's a little hard to see here, the Spectral City series. Sorry for the glare. So um, the latest book in this particular series is A Summoning of Souls. And what I do is very cross genre. So when you guys are talking about genre and sort of the difficult places to how do you get readers to to come into your genre fiction for me it's very cross genre because i grew up reading victorian set novels and fantasy novels and gothic novels and i wanted to um honestly uh put all of those genres into what i do so um, I love a good happy ending, but I also really love a good slow burn happy ending. So um, especially in the case of my Spectral City series, uh, it takes until the third book for them to actually admit their feelings. And I'm a huge fan of that aching in a lot of traditional, you know, old school stories, especially if you're dealing with a time period where you didn't rush a courtship. And my characters are from interfaith backgrounds. I have a Jewish hero and I have a relatively default Protestant heroine. And she's trying to understand and make sure that she respects his culture. It's New York City. It's 1899. Uh, it's a hugely diverse city. I'm a New York City tour guide. The great thing I love about writing in New York is the diversity. So I wanted to write a, a multi-cast um, dynamic. Oh, I think my my picture just went down nope. for a second. You're, You're still good. Okay, I'm, I guess I'm back. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so um, all this to say, um, I I love writing uh, a diverse cast of characters who come together to save the day. And so while there is romance in my stories, there's also fantasy because in the Spectral City series, I have the Ghost Precinct, which is a group of psychic detectives. So I wanted to write a paranormal procedural with, with romantic elements. And lots of ghost stories. So there we have it. We have plus here. Yay, you made it on. <laughs> yeah, yep. I'm trying to adjust the uh, lighting around me so that you can see me. There we go. I think that's a little bit better. Um, I'm Celeste Barkley, and I am in San Diego. Um, I grew up in the Midwest of St. Louis, spent a lot of time on the East Coast. I am an East Coaster living on the West Coast, so that makes for some interesting times. Uh, I'm a little more let go than some of my California friends, but I am also what I call a recovering teacher. I spent 15 years teaching high school and middle school English and social studies. So being a historical romance author and particularly focusing much like Terry on Highlanders, it has definitely allowed me to take a lot of that information that has been percolating in there that my middle school and high school students don't always care about and actually funnel it somewhere. So as I said, I am a historical romance author. I have a Viking series called Viking Glory. I have a Highlander series, well, two of them actually, this is one of them, 
This one is from the Highland Ladies. My other series is the Clan Sinclair. And then I have a pirate series called Pirates of the Isles. Um, I have always been an avid reader. I mean, I don't think that comes as a surprise to most people. If you're logged on here, you are too. Um, but I did a lot of academic writing and that's kind of stuffy and not very entertaining. But that's how I started out. And I was actually recovering from surgery a few years ago. And I was like, I cannot watch another episode of The Big Bang Theory. I have got to find something else to do. I had spent hours watching it on TV while I was recuperating. So I thought to myself, you know, let's just give this a go. Let's take a look. I want something light that I don't have to really struggle to follow, like a Dan Brown series. I don't want to figure out who the murderer is and the villain. I want to enjoy myself. So I started reading and one book led to about 500, which led to about a thousand probably by now. And in the summer of 2017, I thought to myself, you write a lot, but you write boring stuff. How about you write something entertaining and fun and enjoyable? And so I started um, and I started writing that summer and life happened. School started again, um, you know, just got carried away with the every day. But around January, I decided I was gonna go back to it and I was going to finish. I'm a very task oriented person. So long story short, my first book came out April, 2018 and my 21st book out on Monday of next week. So I definitely have kept myself busy. I left the classroom um, a little while ago. So I am now a full-time author and I love it. I find writing really cathartic. Um, I enjoy the escapism that it provides me. And my hope is that my stories provide some escapism. We have countless hours to deal with reality. It's nice to every once in a while, put that aside, hopefully believe you're part of the story and just enjoy and let life happen around you. So that's my deal. Are you, are you glad that you're not a teacher in COVID times? Boy, you want to go for the loaded questions right off the bat, don't you? How um, are you a teacher friend? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't envy them by any means. Um, I've politely told them, please don't request that I come and substitute in your class because I'm not going to. I have two teenage sons who are going to be home again, um, and I I can get very wrapped up in this topic. So suffice it to say, be nice to your kids' teachers. They're doing the best they can. Okay, it's not an easy situation for anybody. Have some patience. Give them a chance, and please don't assume it's going to fail before they start. All right, so I, we have a we have a really diverse mix. The pre, the first session was all mostly contemporary romance people, and now we have kind of a better mix. But some of the people are interested, and let's start by asking to either your traditional or um, independently published. How have you worked with local stores? How have you worked with independent bookstores as opposed to selling online versus going through distribution and, and chain stores? Um, and and how have your how is it how has your successes and failures been working with with indie stores? Let's start with Terry. Oh, sure. Um, well, I learned very early in my career, um, we were part of NABA, which was the New Atlantic Ind Independent Booksellers Organization. And my local romance writers worked very closely with them, attended their events, presented to different stores. So I've been in touch with a number of indie stores in my area. We've just actually had two more open recently 
they're not really romance friendly, so I'm working on that. Um, but uh, I always, you know, try to make myself available, drop off bookmarks, things like that. Um, it's been easier when I was a well with my traditionally published books because of the availability. But I've also made sure that I participate in like Ingram's um, and in Bookshop Doc org so that indie bookstores in my area can order my books i've got my own little you know the shelf set up with all my books listed and i try to make sure that they're available through um as many means possible so independent bookstores can access them so that's kind of how i've worked with indie bookstores liana I definitely find that indie bookstores have been so incredible in terms of just the personal relationships that I can make with them. And I'm really grateful for that because um, I, being cross genre, I need folks to help me find my audience because some people are going to come to me for mystery. Some people are going to come to me for paranormal. Some people are going to come to me for that slow burn romance. Um, so I really think that it's um, quite a wide range of uh, uh, of ways in which people find me. And so a vibrant relationship with an independent bookstore. I have one in New York that I always go to, Word in Brooklyn, and they have a Jersey City branch as well. And so like having a local partnership, I did my launch for Summoning of Souls with them. And it was so wonderful because um, they could help do that local outreach even though the store is closed at the time so i think that um the only way we're really going to have a a, a a vibrant book life is going to be because of the outreach like local bookstores like you have and offer you guys are doing such an important service because you're bridging the gap you're 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 learning your readership and your audience and you're trying to connect them with the authors that you're building relationships with so really book selling both on our side and your side really is about building relationships and so i just try to do that best we can and independent bookstores i can do that relationship directly in a corporate setting with a corporate stores not so much you can't build the same kind of before so i'm grateful for independent stores in that yeah. regard we have a lot of uh, regular customers last year with our reading habits, and not only being able to suggest the next read in in the the areas that they enjoy, but also helping them branch out of that a little bit and and perhaps pick up something a little bit different. So I'm glad that you mentioned that because that's what indie bookstores are all about. Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna bring Leanna out real quick. And then, uh, Celeste, do you wanna answer that question? Yeah, um, I know of one really awesome indie book store that really celebrates and promotes um, romance books, The Little Book Bug on Lancaster. And it's probably like, three hours from San Diego, but it's a store that I'm willing to drive happily to, to do events um, because they are so welcoming to indie authors. And I am an indie author. I, I have one book that was published hybrid, but otherwise um, it's entirely me. I love the independence. And as you may have guessed, 21 books in two years, I'm a prolific writer. So I like working on my timeline and not having to wait. Um, but we have a few different independent bookstores here in the San Diego area. And the ones that I've reached out to have been really receptive and polite and outgoing. Um, they definitely appreciate when authors reach out to them, certainly local ones. Um, we have a writing organization here, San Diego Writers Inc. And they put on First Friday events when we're allowed to and they are able to bring in a lot of you know local artists as well as local writers and so i've been able to meet other um, writers in the area 
I do the San Diego Book Festival, which is also an opportunity for me to meet up with and build those relationships with the independent bookstore owners. Because as was said, that's one of the greatest things about indie anything, whether it's indie publishing or indie bookstores, you're able to build those relationships with readers. And even if it's a virtual relationship, it's still a relationship. They connect to you, they connect to your stories. And I enjoy that. Um, I'm an introvert, so I'm actually very content to stay in my house and not go anywhere. People keep asking me how I'm doing, and I'm happy as a clam, to be honest. But I like the virtual relationships that I can build, and indie bookstores really help with that. See? Um, Lainey and I both published through Bold Strokes Books, which is a, a smaller, independent, um, but books publisher, but they are the largest LGBTQ publisher in, in the world, I believe. Um, so we've, through the publisher, we've we've done a lot of really great bookstore, um, independent bookstores um, events, particularly around Pride events, which um, have been fun. So it kind of brings the whole celebration of the Pride event up and then the community celebrates it through the book shops. Um, so, I think I very much enjoyed that. And I very much appreciate um, that sort of relationship that the small bookstores offer that you, you definitely would never get that with a, a large or anything. Yeah. Eleni? I think I'm echoing what everyone else has said and said that the, in, the small indies are um, wonderful about developing relationship and here in Vermont and New England, um, the small bookstores have been just wonderful. And um, being with Bold Strokes Books, they one of the reasons I chose them is that they have the widest distribution of any LGBTQ publisher um, that they do distribute with Ingram and Baker and Taylor and all the larger distribution venues. And um, being a librarian, I'm really pushing for romance and LGBTQ books in libraries. It, libraries often the gateway to where people discover authors, and then they will go to their indie bookstore and and purchase you know every other book by that author. Yeah. So um, that, so that's um sort of my or personal. If they like that they checked out at the library, then they want to buy it to have it permanently. Exactly. They get a lot of them. Our, our library is only a couple blocks away from the bookstore. So we get a lot of those people coming in who are like, I love this book and now we want it for good. <laughs> yeah. So I, I kind of want to talk some about um, settings because in, in this case, we have such a wide variety. Um, the, the previous group was all contemporary and contemporary gives the benefit of, you don't have to worry as much about um, accuracy. Uh, maybe you have to worry about the settings. You're gonna stick it in an actual real place. They gotta make sure that the real place has that street name in it, things like that, not so much in the you know, what style of kilt was being worn at this particular time frame in this particular setting. Sort of thing. Um, so talk a little bit about how you do settings. Where, why, you know, if you're doing more than one range, why? If you have your niche, what brought you to it? And, um, and, 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 and kind of why that's, that's kind of where you are. As, as a as a scene builder. Celeste, you want to start? Yeah. Sure. Um, like I said before, I am a recovering social studies teacher, so there is a ton of information rattling around in my head. Um, my mother's English. I grew up reading. Um, English literature more than anything else. So writing um, stories that are set in Great Britain make it 
pretty easy for me. I'm familiar with a lot of the locations, um, the vernacular, some of the phrases that I'm able to throw in there. Um, and Scotland's beautiful. It's rugged and has a rich history in of itself. Um, it's by its own nature, rather a romantic place. And when you toss in, you know, the historical facts to, to add to the romantic suspense element that I have, it makes it really easy, in my opinion, to build these settings. Um, that's not to say I don't fall down the wormhole every once in a while and, you know, look at my computer and I've you know, just spent an hour and a half researching what was supposed to be an easy task and ended up into some obscure detail that I might not even work into my story. But I gotta admit, I enjoy doing that. Um, I do strive for a lot of historical accuracy. Um, the one thing I am willing to throw to the wind, though, um, because it's kind of a genre expectation, is that kilts did not come into place until well after the Middle Ages. I know, but readers, including me, enjoy an attractive man in a kilt. Sorry, but that's what you're gonna get. Um, but with my Viking stories and my pirates as well, they are historically based. Um, I really do strive for a lot of accuracy. Every once in a while, I take some creative license and I might rearrange some of the events or kind of condense them, you know, 10 years into 10 months. But I generally include a foreword in my books when I do that, kind of explaining what the real events were and why I shifted the dates. Um, but particularly in my Highlanders, all the clans are real. All the conflict between the clans is real. All the castles divided in are real. Um, the timeline is accurate. Though, like I said, sometimes I kind of condense it a little bit to make the story work. But Scotland's a beautiful place, and my pirates are Scottish. Um, my Vikings have an adventure in Scotland, so I'm world building. All my series are connected, even if they're a couple centuries apart. And I suppose that having everything that you write set in Scotland means going to Scotland is a tax write off, too. Well, so I was supposed to be in there for two weeks in June to celebrate my 40th birthday with my husband. So that will be next summer. Yeah. You hope. <laughs> All right. Uh, see? Um, I do write contemporary romance. Um, but the fact that it is a lesbian romance, I think there's a lot of angst that's built in the fact that you can't um, assume that somebody's lesbian. <laughs> so there's a lot of secrecy there, a lot of angst that's built right into gay culture. Um, so, um, yeah, my setting is usually a small town. I like the small town romance and I kind of use the setting that I have in my area. So I do write, you know, realistically what I know. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lainey? Lainey? I write um, contemporary. It's set in New England. Um, I find New England has mountains, uh, seashore, cities, um, small towns. So I've got a, a quite a variety of places to um, have my characters grow and learn and fall in love. And um, Yeah, I've lived in four of the New England states, so it's familiar to me. I do go down the rabbit hole of research because I'm a librarian and it, that's so much fun to research. And um, I have found that it's, my imagination can say, let's write about um, someone who's a roller derby player, uh, which in the real thing, um, one of my characters is on a roller derby team. Um, but I have to do research and get that very accurate where there's someone on a roller derby team that's going to write to me and tell me exactly what I didn't get right um, correctly. So with a lot of professions, I found that you do have to do quite a bit of research. Um, you might only use this much, but this much has to be very accurate. Mary? Um, when it comes to settings, I've done everything from 
1975 Vikings in Scotland down to um, Regency England and Edinburgh and uh, everything medieval in between. Um, I was drawn to Scotland. My first books were set in Scotland before I ever set foot in Scotland. And so I think I tried, I do the research. Oh my gosh, I do the research. I don't know if you can see my bookcase. That's half of my research books behind me. Um, I love to do the research, but I write fiction. And so I take great license in terms of what I write. Um, but I strive for authenticity. I want a reader to come away feeling that they were in Scotland or Regency England or Edinburgh or wherever. Um, so I do as, uh, I think it was Celeste, was it, that mentioned um, an author's note. Um, I always explain when I do, I have a healthy respect for history, um, but I, I do explain when I vary from it. But I think Scotland is, is one of those archetypal settings, locations, mythologies, and something in it just draws me. Um, and so um, I, I set a lot of stories there. Um, but, and yes, as you mentioned, yes, it's a write-off. <laughs> um, sadly though, when I flipped my calendar to August, my trip to Scotland, which was supposed to happen in two weeks, it has been canceled. So we'll have to wait on that. But I do, um, I, I just think that it's these foreign places and times that, that call us right now as an escape, you know, simpler things, good and evil were very clear and um, it was easy to identify. And um, as I said, I, I love the history, but I like the, I, I go for the epic feel. So do you find that uh, you're willing to accept uh, lack of historical accuracy in, in exchange for story? Um, I think, let's see, I'm really very close to being historically accurate. But if I find a fact that really interferes with story, to me, story trumps everything. Because people, you know, I've, I've read now looking back at some of the, um, the big names, Julie Garwood, for example, that was one of the authors I started reading. And she wrote historical set in Scotland, which are terribly inaccurate. But I go back and I reread them all the time because the story is amazing. So I think that by acknowledging my my move away from certain facts or people or timing, um, I've done the research. I know I'm changing it. I don't change it by error. Okay. But story story trumps everything. Okay. All right. Leanna? Leanna? Well, for me, really, honestly, um, my whole deal is that I love the Victorian era, and um, I've been drawn to that since I was a kid. I don't, I can't really explain why I was drawn to it since I was a kid, other than maybe it's like a past life thing. Um, and uh, and with that draw into the 19th century, it's not that I want it to be a rose-colored portrayal. So I do try to be very accurate. It's a tough time to live if you are not. If you're not a rich white guy, um, then it was a tough time uh, for lots of people. But in that late Victorian era is a lot of the time, that's where we get our first vestiges of suffrage. We, we get our first vestiges of civil rights. We start to really get the push societally for a better, um, a better world. And you start to get things like labor law. We start to get things like... Uh, uh, laws against cruelty to animals, things like that. And so my characters are very justice oriented. And so with that in mind, there's really a whole lot that I'm interested in writing about where I involve paranormal things, but the paranormal aspects allow my characters who are seeking to make the world a better place, some a some assets, gives them some ways around societal conventions. So I use the paranormal and fantasy elements to lift up the actual history and give them some tricks and some uh, ways in which they can actually improve their circumstances because of the paranormal aspect. So I, I try to use friendly ghosts in a way to help further the mystery because they have aspects, uh, they know things that the rest of the characters don't know. So it's a really, 
exciting thing for me to try to find the ways in which real history can be deeply exciting and then merge that with, in, especially in terms of my ghosts, things that the late Victorians were very interested in. They wanted to have seances. They were interested in spiritualism. Um, so the fact that my characters are spiritualists and interacting with, with the dead in seances is something that's very true to that era. And being in New York um, is such a dynamic time to be a part of the Gilded Age in New York. There was so much dynamic things happening. And I love tapping into that as a writer. It's just been a thrilling thing uh, to find ways in which fantastical actually directly dovetails into actual history. It's really been fun. <sighs> Um, I want to ask you about independently published. Yeah, well, you kind of went that. into that. Yeah. Um, I just want to remind the viewers that if anyone has a question, feel free to ask, and then um, we'll start the Q and A section in about five minutes. All right. So, what are the questions I asked? I don't know. Uh, nobody thought this up so far. How have you done your marketing and done your um, uh, and, and done different platforms? I mean, are, are you focused on I'm selling online, I've got one outlet, or are you putting it on every platform you can? Do you do audiobooks? Um, kind of how, how are you treating this as, as the business end of? publishing as opposed to the writing end of publishing. Lainey, you want to start? I am not self-published. I'm with a publisher. And so the publisher handles a lot of that that end. And and I voted for that because I'm also a full-time public libra librarian. Right. So I knew I didn't have time to both write and run my own business. Um, they they are they have very wide distribution. I'm not in audio yet because I'm a new, fairly new author. Um, so and I think audio is a little bit more expensive to produce. And so the um, authors that have been around a little while and sell a bit more than I do, they get they get audio books. Um, but I'm looking forward to being in audio someday. Who who is your publisher? My publisher is Bold Strokes Books, the same okay. as C. Spencer. Right. Okay. Well, you guys have mentioned that. Okay. okay. Uh, let's go with Terry here. Sure. Well, I'm with um, my, I guess almost 30 of my books are through Harlequin. And of course, Harlequin is one of the largest publishers in the world. Um, my books come out in anywhere from 10 to 20 languages in 20 to 25 countries around the world with Harlequin. Um, I have had a couple go into audiobooks. And, and again, as uh, Lainey just mentioned, the publisher handles all of those. Um, with my indie work, right now, the I've done indie more projects are novellas or shorter projects. I have them on all available book platforms, um, all vendors, as well as Ingram's, as I mentioned, so that indie bookstores have access to them in print or in digital. Um, and I actually am looking to expand some of the backlist books. Some of my publishers were so long ago that I've gotten the rights to my books back. And, um, I'm looking at uh, putting some of those out in um, foreign languages because romance is an amazingly strong market in Italy and France and Germany. And so rather than audiobooks, I'm actually looking at some um, foreign language translations of my own, um, my the books I have back. Um, you, yeah. Do, are you going to do those yourself or are you going to? Oh. Um, yes, probably self-publish. Um, yes, work with the translator. Uh, I belong to a couple of very large groups of indie authors. Some of the biggest in the world are in these groups, and there's a lot of um, information and, and support available. So yeah, I'm looking um, at self-publishing um, some of the foreign 
languages. Yeah. See, what about you? Um, well, I read Bold Strokes books, um, like I mentioned. So they do a great deal of marketing and publicity um, for us. But separately, I also do the social media. Um, earlier this year, I got a radio appearance, which was nice, a little local radio appearance um, to spread the word in the area. Um, book events like this um, with bookshops. We also do um, Pride events. So a lot of the authors nationwide um, will set up a table at Pride events and kind of introduce ourselves to the local people and, and introduce the publisher as well, because it's it's not as broadly known that there are really, really a broad range of books out there um, that are LGBT content. Um, and and it, it spans romance, um, paranormal, fantasy, you name it, which is great. I have a question for you. Yeah. I brought up earlier with uh, trying to figure out how to organize up the section. Um, have you had experience with our, our is it better to genre separate out LGBT together, or is it better to mix it with other things? Um, there was, there was, um, I want to say, an Olivia Wilde book came out earlier this year that mm -hmm. had a strong lesbian storyline that has sold surprisingly well for me. I mean, it was, it was one of those where it came out and people kept like, ordering it, kept selling, and, and, and but it was just mixing with everything. Else. I mean. But how have you found as far as short as, as stuff to gel? Do you find it better to be separated into a subcategory or just shelf you know, everything else? I mean, I think I think a lot of the authors under our publisher are split on that. Um, there's some top sellers, Georgia Beers and Melissa Brayden, I think, have been categorized within romance, which is great because personally I've had, you know straight readers, gay readers, men, women, the whole range, because it's really not pigeonholed. You don't have to be gay to read it. gay. I read straight romance through my whole life until, you know, the gay publishing really picked up. Um, as a reader myself and as a lesbian, I, I honestly like the category separated um, because I, I like to just, I mean, I like to read about stories that are more relevant to my life because we're very, narrow and there's not there's not a lot of it so um it's easier to find but at the same time as an author i mean i, I really would love to be exposed you know i have my books exposed to all audiences so yeah it's, it, it's, it's, it's a big debate in our store where it, should we segregate it should we merge everybody together it's we never come up with an answer and, and it's not just in, in this category either Right. You know, um, you know, I have people coming in asking where you know the books by black authors are, and I'm like, they're everywhere. I mean, it's, I, right. you know, now we have one bookcase of them because it's become important in the last few months. But, but generally, you know, it's in psychology, it's in history, it's in you know all of those things. So it's and 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 like I said, I mean, it's still I think it's going to be a work in progress as we try to figure out what to do next. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, we need to get uh, Leanna. Leanna, you keep popping in and out here. Can you hear us? Yes. The camera's on. Oh. Leanna? The camera's going on and off. Yeah, your camera's going on and off. That's weird. Okay, I'm gonna pop Leanna off and then add in. Um, let's see, who do I want to use the last time? This is like it's like Wizard of Oz. I swear. No <laughs> attention. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. I, I, everybody's really quiet in the audience here. Nobody's asking any questions. So shame on all y'all. Have these wonderful authors in here that can call here. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> invite undefined. Okay. 
that's that's last one. Oh, not able to get Celeste back up here. So So did you have any other questions or should we just wrap think, it up? I think that's most of it unless you can get this last or uh, oh there we go. You got a question. Oh we got a question. <laughs> Rhonda, who I believe is in session one, um, she asked, which of your books would you like to see turned into a movie and who would star? So uh, Terry, why don't you start? Oh, I've often thought my first book, which was actually a time travel to medieval Scotland, A Love Through Time, would be like a fabulous fabulous movie action adventure everything um and who would play i'm 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 right now i'm stuck on clive standen who has been playing rollo in vikings and he's done some modern tv roles but i'm telling you that man with long hair and okay um i want to see him in any any of my books made into movies the the, the female character not sure but him <laughs> Sorry, shallow. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, see? Oh well, both of my books would be great. I'm, I I build them around friendship, so I think I think that's appealing to you know any movie. But um, if I pinned a character to an actress or model, I would say Erica Linder for my second book. Um, on second thought, would be ideal. Yeah, Lainey. It would probably be my first book, A Chapter on Love. It takes place, um, one of the main characters manages a used bookstore, and the other character is a forest ranger park manager. And when, as everyone else was talking, I'm like, who would I want to play with them? And I'm blanking completely on who I would like to play with them. It's a great question. So I'm gonna have to come up with an answer to that if I'm ever asked it again, but um, it would definitely be the, the first book, a chapter on love. Very good. Um, so, so, Celeste, uh, let's try to get her back in here. One second. To be doing something entertaining, by the way. I know. Puppet show. Puppet show. Yes. <laughs> no, Crowdcast needs to add more screens in here. Uh, I don't know that it's working. I'm not sure that we're going to get Leanna back in. Um, yeah. So, anyway. Um, Thank you all for participating in this. And uh, next year, we hope it'll be a little bit smoother and that we won't be in COVID. And maybe we can do it in person and you can come to Sacramento and enjoy this lovely 114 degree weather. <laughs> oh. well, thank you very much for inviting us. This was wonderful. Celeste, do you want to answer the movie question? Uh, well, Terry, you kind of stole my answer, of course. <laughs> um, I would pretty much say any actor or actress from Vikings or The Last Kingdom, I would totally be down for that. And if you've ever watched Jason Momoa in The Frontier, which is a Netflix series, I would not mind if he played any of my heroes. I'll go back and turn them all into brunettes if I could get him to be the hero. But yeah, I mean, honestly, Vikings or The Last Kingdom, those are shows that I absolutely love watching. Um, and they're good. They're well acted. So I would be honored if any of them were in a in a book that was cast to film. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to try to get Leanna in one last time. There 
There we go. If it's like me, it kept asking me to join and then making me test my camera. So that may be why it's taking her a moment. Okay. Well, we'll just wait for a second. So are you all turn it, tuning into the Princess Diaries later? Or is it two, three, four? Actually, that's past now. That's starting at four o'clock East Coast. Mm -hmm. That's seven o'clock. I, I think it's seven o'clock, four o'clock. Seven o'clock. East Coast. Ah, okay, so we're still yeah. good. I was, I, I, yeah, it gets confusing yeah. with East Coast and West Coast. Just got to add three or subtract three. I know. That's math, though. I'm, I'm more about the graphics and all that, not the math. <laughs> it took me forever when I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast to not change. And I always had to think, okay, so which side is the ocean going to be on when I'm headed north? Is it going to be on my left or is it yeah. going to be on my right? So you know, it took me a while to be able to change over. Atlantic City and it was evening time and we were sitting out by the ocean and I, I asked him, why isn't the sun setting? <laughs> he left at me. He's like, out here you get the sun rise. It's not like our Pacific <laughs> It's just all weird. So, um, Leanna, do you want to answer the movie question? I would love to, actually, because I am a big fan of Tip Timothy Chalamet, and he's the perfect both age and ethnicity, and his background would be really perfect for my hero, Detective Jacob Horowitz. Um, he, he's just got a wonderful quality. If you remember him from Little Women, uh, yes. The most recent adaptation of Little Women, yeah. you will remember, uh, he's fantastic. So he's my perfect hero. Um, and I'm a big fan of Sayors Ronan. Um, and I think she'd be a great um, heroine uh, for, uh, uh, it's tricky with a period piece. So you kind of want to sort of see, um, you know, if if folks have done a period piece already, how, how they act in it to make sure that they've you sort of vetted them for being able to do period pieces. So mm -hmm. both of them were so great in the uh, most recent Little Women. So I'm just stealing that cast and putting it into my book. There you go. <laughs> well, that about wraps everything up. I don't see any more questions. So um, thank you all for this opportunity thank you to do you and celebrate romance authors. Thanks for today. having us. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great time. Thank you.